good evening uh, good afternoon uh, greetings to all friends across uh, geographies who have found time to join uh, this conversation about the future trajectory of brics uh, his excellency russia's ambassador of india denis alepo in absentia russia's uh, mr roman uh, babushkin deputy chief of mission russian embassy india his excellency south africa's high commissioner to india uh, high commissioner designate anil suklal ambassador kanwal sibal ambassador sanjay bhattacharya dr victoria panova will join shortly nicholas bushu will join shortly dipanjan roy choudhury excellencies uh, ladies and gentlemen friends i welcome you all to this online conference on brics uh, 2.0 new members new horizons which has been organized in the run up to the 16th brics summit in the russian city of kazan my name is manish chand i am ceo and director center for global india insights a think tank focused on global affairs and india rights network a media publishing organizer organization focused on uh, global affairs and the publisher of india and the world uh, magazine uh, ladies and gentlemen friends we are extremely lucky to have uh, such a stellar panel comprising eminent diplomats academics and experts who between them have decades of expertise and experience in diplomacy and related areas we are meeting at a time when the world order is going through an unprecedented churn crises and conflicts are proliferating and geopolitical fault lines are deepening indeed is the age of poly crisis and paranoia trust deficit is growing some would say amid competitive games for power and domination is also a time of structural changes in the international system uh, and multilateralism the old order is crumbling but the outlines of an emerging world order are only dimly visible the global south is rising and some would say the north is waking up to the urgency of accommodating rising and emerging powers along with other developing countries in this emerging global order Uh, but there is still a long way to go before the international order and global governance institutions become genuinely inclusive and democratic reflecting surging aspirations of emerging countries this is where brics or rather brics 2.0 the new incarnation or reincarnation of brics comes into the picture the motto of the russian presidency and the summit in kazan is strengthening multilateralism for equitable global development and security the two key words operative expressions here are strengthening multilateralism and equitable development which in a way encapsulate the future direction of brics as well as the emerging world order the search for equity and equality amid the widening gap between the rich and the poor and the north and the south uh, cannot be overstated it is this quest for equity and inclusion which is driving a large number of countries ranging from thailand and vietnam to cuba and senegal to join the brics against this backdrop this conference will focus on the expansion of brics and its ramifications for the evolving world order according to proponents of expansion an expanded brics plus can become a potent and effective platform for emerging and middle powers to advance their aspirations and push for changes in the west dominated global system to project their interest on the other hand many countries are concerned that the potential inclusion of diverse countries will complicate uh, uh, consensus building and decision making thereby reducing efficacy and cohesion of the grouping in this conference today we will explore the possible future trajectory of brics what an expanded brics 2.0 will look like there are many speculation will it become a parallel g20 of the global south or will become a cumbers uh, an unwieldy organization like g77 or will it end up becoming a coalition of emerging powers and developing countries probably capping at 30 there are no clear answers as of now to these questions uh even as we speak uh, sherpas and su sherpas 
of BRICS countries are negotiating the final document. The Russian ambassador's speech will provide some clues, but we'll have a more concrete picture only at the Kazan summit on October 22, 24. The seminar will also explore the following sub-themes, role of BRICS in promoting global governance reforms, including reform and expansion of the UN Security Council, and intra-BRICS trade and investment, and use of national currencies. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, for me, uh, hosting this conference as a special personal resonance, I was there at Ekaterinburg in 2009, when the first BRIC summit was held. S was missing. It was only four countries then, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. I remember the excitement and confusion at that time. Some hailed it as a new beginning in reinventing the world order. The skeptics, on the other hand, dubbed it as an alphabet soup. Next year, in 2010, South Africa was added, making the grouping bricks. And last year, at the Johannesburg summit, five members were added. And now, in the beautiful city of Kazan, at least 10 countries are expected to be added as partner countries, paving the way for the induction at the next summit in 2025. So with these few words as a backdrop, uh, let me just outline some uh, house rules for the discussion. Uh, this uh, webinar is being live streamed on our YouTube and Facebook channels. Uh, those who are attending and logged in in uh, YouTube and Facebook can ask questions and type it there, or they can send us to editor at the rate of indiarights.org. Uh, now, uh, I need to uh, announce that Russian ambassador to India, His Excellency Denis Alipo, was expected to be here in virtually at least here uh, to speak to us. Uh, but due to some urgent uh, meetings, he had to excuse himself. But he has sent a recorded message, uh, uh, a recorded uh, uh, video recorded message. Uh, a speech which I'll, uh, our team will uh, play it now. Anil, can you play it on? Speech by Ambassador. Anil. Dear friends, greetings to all of you. Uh, my words of appreciation to Sri Manish Chand, uh, Chief Executive Officer and Director of the Center for Global India Insights for um, having us today and uh, for uh, organizing the today's platform and for giving the opportunity to, to exchange the views on, on the BRICS on the threshold of the 16th annual summit that will take place shortly in Russia, in Kazan, uh, starting October 22nd. We, are, we look forward to welcoming Honorable Honorable Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi ji, and uh, around 40 other heads of states and prominent leaders to participate in regular and outreach BRICS Plus sessions. The motto of the Russian Presidency uh, and the um, uh, forthcoming summit is the strength strengthening multilateralism for equitable global development and security. I would like to particularly welcome uh, the new South African High Commissioner to India, Dr. Anil Suklau, who has by virtue been the longest serving BRICS Sherpa and whose expertise in BRICS is undisputed. BRICS is a multi-dimensional phenomenon. It has become an influential platform for developing, uh, for de developing and emerging economies to take forward a rich agenda and to promote democratization of the global governance reflective of our growing influence. It offers a diversified, inclusive and consensus-based cooperation within more than 80 sectoral tracks structured into the three buskets policy and security economy and finance and humanitarian and cultural ties BRICS respects civilizational diversity and offers the uh, the the um, platform to m a mutually beneficial dialogue free from pressure 
free from double standards or interference in domestic affairs. No wonder that a large number of countries uh, has expressed interest in joining and we see, we see it natural for the BRICS to expand in one way or another. After our membership has doubled last year, which is itself a landmark, we move towards the establishment of a partner country category to enable interested uh, states to join our practical cooperation. We think we must satisfy their ex expectations that would consolidate BRICS uh, and its potential as a dedicated mechanism to promote the agenda of the global south. I would not prejudge who exactly uh, is going to be invited uh, as a partner country and what are the criteria, but certainly those states should be economically ambitious and should oppose illegitimate sanctions against member states. I presume we are all against the phantom itching for dictate and restricting cooperation with other nations. The case in point is that geopolitical and practical relevance of the BRICS is growing, not only despite uh, uncertainties, but because of them, reflecting the demand for a more equitable cooperation in a multipolar environment. Around 200 events have already taken place under the Russian presidency this year uh, as a testimony that the ex expanded BRICS has succeeded. Our main focus uh, was to ensure a smooth adaptation of new members to the BRICS culture and traditions and the overall ecosystem. With new members, BRICS represents over 30% of the world's land area, 45% of the population, 40% of oil production, up to 25% of exports. The combined GDP of the BRICS nations has long surpassed that of the G7. One of the biggest values has been the sincere dedication to find amicable solutions and a common ground when it comes to difficult issues. We highly appreciate the support of our presidency in this regard. Much uh, welcomed was the participation of Lok Sabha Speaker Honorable Om Birla in the BRICS Parliamentary Forum in July in St. Petersburg uh, and the participation of other high uh, Indian officials in various meetings, regular involvement of the National Security Advisor Sri Ajit Doval in the BRICS high-level meetings on security matters is always critically important. We have conducted ministerial meetings on foreign affairs, education, environment, agriculture, sports, tourism, transport and space. Uh, exciting and future-oriented were the newly launched Nuclear Medicine Working Group, Academic uh, Ocean and Polar Science Fora, Fire Drills, Film Festival, Sports Games. We have held <coughs> meetings on uh, counter-terrorism, intellectual property and standard, uh, standardiza standardization, industry, customs, climate change, policy planning, nanotechnologies, SME support, energy transition tracks, youth summit, uh, as well as women, digital business and fashion fora, and the cultural festival and many other. Pursuing the goals of sustainable economic development, we concentrate on expanding the uh, new development bank-sponsored infrastructure projects, currently exceeding 35 billion USD. We are coherently moving to, uh, towards creating reliable payment mechanisms through the use of national currencies, as well as 
through the dialogue on digital currencies as priority area. A need of the hour is to have an alternative to the SWIFT system in order to make our transactions independent and uninterrupted to promote deeper integration of our national financial systems. As like-minded countries, we closely coordinate on various international issues, primarily on the G20 agenda, to ensure that the developing, na developing nations are getting an equal access to technological, financial, uh, and natural, natural resources in order to remove development gaps and achieve sustainable development goals. Consecutive presidency of BRICS members India, Brazil and South Africa in this global forum is critical for fulfilling the needs and aspirations of the developing world. As was reiterated by President Putin, the main task of the Russian chairmanship in BRICS is to create favorable conditions for all participants to efficiently use our economic investment and technological and human resources potential for the best of interests of our nations and at the same time to strengthen a constructive contribution of the BRICS to make the world more secure and harmonious. Thank you very much. Okay. Hello, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, yeah, we can. Yes. Uh, thank you uh, so much uh, for that overarching uh, big picture view. And, uh, uh, you know, your uh, ambassador has set the stage and uh, Deputy Chief of Mission Roman Babushkin will be uh, there later to take any questions connected to uh, Russian presidency. Uh, uh, some of the things you said uh, about expansion and the criteria for expansion, uh, we will discuss as we go along. Now, my uh, pleasure and honor to invite uh, South Africa's High Commissioner designate, uh, Professor Anil Suklal. He is South Africa's first Indian origin High Commissioner to India, uh, former academic. Suklal, uh, Professor Suklal has had a distinguished career in diplomacy, holding several senior positions in joining the Department of International Relations and Cooperation in 1995. He has served as ambassador at large to Asia and BRICS, Deputy Director General for Asia and Middle East, and South Africa's ambassador to the EU. For the purpose of today's uh, discussion, as the ambassador emphasized in his speech, he is probably one of the longest serving, uh, was one of the longest serving Sherpas. So he knows the process, he knows it from inside, he's an insider, he brings a wealth of expertise to this discussion. Uh, with uh, these words, I invite uh, uh, His Excellency Anil Suklal to address uh, uh, two questions in his uh, uh, initial remarks. Number first, uh, what challenges do you see? You know, we, I mean, we don't know how the expansion is going to unfold. But with 10 more members being added, what challenges do you see uh, uh, in integrating these new members into the existing uh, BRICS framework? And do you think it will dilute the cohesiveness of the grouping? That's number one. And uh, the second is the South Africa has been a very strong advocate for, you know, an inclusive BRICS uh, and also for promoting African resurgence and renaissance uh, through BRICS. Uh, uh, I, uh, what is your response to that? You have around eight to ten minutes to address this question. Over to you, uh, His Excellency. 
Thank you, Manish, uh, first of all, for convening this uh, very appropriate discussion. And my greetings to all my colleagues, some of whom I've had the privilege of working alongside with uh, over the years. And many thanks for the kind words of welcome from all of you uh, upon mm -hmm. me being my tenure here uh, as High Commissioner. I'm still designate, not yet High Commissioner, but uh, it's such a privilege to be in India uh, and a great privilege to be a fellow British country representing South Africa. I think uh, it's important for us to note, and I said this at the first SHEPA meeting earlier this year in Moscow, uh, that Russia was so much part of the founding of the BRICS family and the first hosted the first summit, as you rightfully pointed out, uh, Manish, way back in 2009. And there were mixed reactions to the uh, convening of the first summit and where this uh, configuration will, will go. <clears throat> now we're back in Russia in 2024, a very vastly changed global landscape and even more complex than last year when South Africa held the presidency of BRICS. Now, if I can go back a few steps. What the hell is happening here? What is happening? Where is it gone now? Oh, church. Okay. Eight minutes. Okay. Okay. He should be here shortly. I think there's some a bit of technical snag at his end. Some internet issue. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes. I think I, I lost connection a bit. My apologies. <clears throat> so I, I was saying that last year the focus was largely on, on expansion, <clears throat> but we addressed the issue of expansion last year, uh, which I thought was done quite effectively. There was such a large number of countries wanting to become full BRICS members, but as the summit of 2022 took a decision that. Uh, we should ex examine the criteria and come up with rules and guiding principles for expansion, which we did. And that was uh, possible then to bring in the new members. And we invited, as you know, six members to become part of the BRICS family at the summit in, in Johannesburg last year. Four of them formally joined. Well, actually five joined. Argentina did write formally to join uh, and become a full member, but they withdrew uh, the membership. and. Saudi Arabia was invited to join, but has yet to take a decision on it. But we now have an expanded BRICS. It's with nine members. And while South Africa, I think, had the easier task of dealing with expansion, Russia this year had to deal with an expanded BRICS. For the first time, uh, we had the Sherpa meeting in January with nine member states in attendance. That changed, uh, of course, the very nature of BRICS cooperation. Because there were five of us that were well schooled uh, in the way BRICS function, and we had now the four new members uh, that had to adjust to the way BRICS conducts its business and function. Now, I think at this summit there were two questions that were left out that were left to the summit this year by our leaders that required attention. Paragraph 45 specifically spoke to tasking our finance ministers and our central gov bank governors to consider the issue of local currency, payment instruments, and platforms, and to report back at this summit. So I think that's going to be a major development to see what uh, our finance ministers or central governor, uh, bank governor, whoever dealt with it, will report in, in terms of recommendations around payment. And platform. 
I'll come back to that in a short while. The second major issue was where they tasked foreign ministers to further develop the BRICS partner country model and <clears throat> to come up with a list of prospective partner countries and report by the next summit. So this will be the other major issue that uh, leaders will have to consider. And I'm sure Shepherds are busy with this as they are in negotiations at, negotiations at the moment. Now, the question you raised about challenges with an expanded BRICS, I think I've alluded to the fact that the five of us have been functioning over the past 15 summits and we have developed a protocol in terms of how we conduct ourselves. It's a consensus based organization. And by and large, <clears throat> we have divided BRICS into three pillars and our work is arranged around these three pillars, the political security, economic finance and social and people to people pillars. And a fourth unseen pillar is a continuous process of looking at strengthening institutional strengthening uh, and coordination mechanisms of BRICS. Now, if you have to look at the current environment, we didn't have the complexity of the Gaza situation last year when we chaired uh, BRICS. And I think that under the political and security uh, pillar will receive uh, attention by our leaders. I'm sure when our NSA uh, representatives met and they will provide a report as it's mandatory at BRICS summit in terms of their discussion in the closed meeting to the leaders, I'm sure they're going to comment on all the major uh, geopolitical issues, both regionally and internationally, as well as the security challenges as it impacts on all of us and the recommendations that will come out of that. Now, one of the challenges that already emerged, as is traditional on the margins of uh, UNGA, <clears throat> the BRICS foreign ministers traditionally meet, and we have an outcome document, uh, a media statement, as we call it. Now, for the first time, for the first time, we were not able to issue a media statement following the foreign ministers meeting in New York because they could not reach consensus. And this, again, demonstrate that as we expand, the issue of consensus become even more difficult because of a more divergent viewpoints on, on critical global issues that impacts on us, impacts on our national security, and it becomes difficult to, to compromise on some of these. Now, of course, I'm sure that we will have a summit outcome document. Uh, that is the tradition in, in BRICS. And we always were able, no matter how far apart we may have been on issues, we were all, always able to reach consensus. And I'm confident under Russia's able leadership and under President Putin's able leadership, we'll have a very good uh, substantive uh, summit declaration. I have no, no doubt about that. Now, whether BRICS is being diluted as it expands, it depends what you mean by dilution. Uh, in I actually think BRICS is not being diluted. BRICS is being strengthened because there was careful consideration in terms of the new members that we brought in as full members, the four full members. Now, this year, we are not bringing in full members. We are bringing in partner countries. For the first time, we're creating, if one may want to call it that, a two-tier uh, BRICS because you're going to have full members, the nine members, and then you're going to have partner countries. But the modalities that needed to be finalized in terms of uh, what would be the criteria in selecting the partner countries, and more importantly, what role will partner countries play? Will they be fully integrated in all the work streams? We have about 20 ministerial work streams and an innumerable number of expert groups uh, meetings. Uh, where do we bring them in? I think all of this is something that Shepas were busy with. Whether that's going to will be finalized and adopted by the leaders, we'll have to wait and see uh, at the summit. But I think it's important, in my view, the expansion of BRICS is actually a plus factor. It demonstrates that there is a great deal of uh, there is a great need in the global community for leadership. And that's, that leadership is seen within BRICS. And that is why you have such a large number of countries, diverse countries. And increasingly, you are seeing a few countries from the global north 
starting to knock the door of BRICS. And I think that's significant. Now, I know I'm running out of time, but very quickly to come to the uh, question raised about the inclusion of, of Africa within BRICS. I think uh, last year we had a major breakthrough where the African Union under India's presidency was made a full member of, of uh, the G20. But BRICS has always been inclusive of Africa. As early as 2013, a year after we joined BRICS, uh, when we hosted uh, BRICS, we brought the concept of outreach and we invited the African leaders. And since then, Africa has been an integral part of the BRICS agenda. As you saw last year in the BRICS Plus and extended BRICS meeting, we had almost all of the African countries present, over 60 plus countries from the global south and over almost 50 African countries were present. And I think you saw the endorsement from the African, not only the African Union, but the African continent, the number of leaders that attended and identified with the goals and values that BRICS stand for. So I think you, you, what you have today is in this very complex global order that is fracturing even more by the day. You, the gel that is bringing countries together, especially the majority global south, 85% of the global population is BRICS. Now, if for a moment, imagine if there was no BRICS, if we did not have a BRICS configuration, who would take care of the issues pertaining to the developing world, the global south, and the continuous hegemony that we still experience from some quarters of the world? So BRICS is a positive force for change. It will continue to grow precisely because we are championing the very cause that all of us subscribe to in creating a more inclusive, fair, just uh, global society. Thank you. Let me leave it there, Manish. And, and your optimism about the future of BRICS. Uh, and the expansion of BRICS. The expansion of BRICS is a plus factor that BRICS will continue to be a positive force for change and BRICS 2.0 uh, will remain a dynamic force in international affairs. Uh, with uh, Now let me move on to Ambassador uh, Conversible. He uh, really needs no introduction. Uh, he was uh, he is Chancellor, currently Chancellor of Jawaharlal Nehru University. He served as India's Foreign Secretary from July 2002 to November 2003. Uh, throughout his career, he held important ambassadorial positions. He served as ambassador to Turkey, Egypt, France, and Russia. And uh, beyond his diplomatic career, he has uh, excelled in literature, philosophies. He earned titles like Grand Doctor of Philosophy and Full Professor. So he has a very eclectic range of interest and he has been tracking uh, Russia and BRICS for years. Uh, so Ambassador Sibyl, uh, uh, my two questions to you are, uh, number one, that uh, what is an expanded BRICS, BRICS Plus or BRICS 2.0 uh, mean for India's interest? How will India navigate uh, this expanded BRICS? Uh, and some also argue that uh, you know, the inclusion of new members and all the contestation which is going on even as we speak now uh, will intensify geopolitical rivalry within the grouping. Some say that China will get to set the agenda through new members. Uh, what is your take on this cluster of interrelated questions? Well, um, I think the expansion of BRICS inherently is a positive thing. Uh, because we, we are increasing the space uh, for the Global South uh, to participate uh, in uh, discussions uh, on uh, multilateralism, but that is the theme of uh, this, this summit in a few days, uh, because we all know that multilateralism, uh, which was always uh, in trouble, uh, has virtually collapsed. We have currently two very serious conflicts that are going on, in one in Ukraine, the other in West Asia or the Middle East. Um, and both have the potential uh, of exploding into something much bigger. In the case of Ukraine, now the nuclear dimension has become relevant. 
uh, and in the case of West Asia, uh, why the regional power war uh, can uh, be visualized if uh, there is no restraint uh, put on uh, uh, the principal player uh, in the current scenario, uh, which is Israel and which is defying the United Nations uh, and proceeding on its uh, own uh, agenda of uh, uh, making sure that its, its security is fully taken care of uh, without thought to what the security challenges it may face in the future. Because these things can never be <laughs> decided definitively. Now, in the case of India, uh, as I said, BRICS is, the expansion is a positive thing. Uh, because we've always uh, spoken for greater role of the developing countries in global governance. And this has been uh, denied uh, uh, to us, to the global south in general, though some concessions uh, have had to be made because power has shifted progressively uh, from the west to the east for economic power. Uh, and in its wake, political influence, uh, and of course, uh, the military aspect also has become uh, uh, different with the way and the kind of uh, military power that it is uh, uh, acquiring. Uh, so therefore, uh, as I was mentioned at the G20, uh, we were in favor of including the African Union in the G20, again, with the idea that uh, the agenda of the G20 uh, should not be that of the priorities and interests of the G7 country, but to reflect the wider interests uh, of uh, the developing organization. Similarly, in the case of uh, the BRICS, the expanded BRICS, uh, we would focus uh, on uh, the uh, needs and uh, uh, issues that are priorities for the development. Uh, countries. This is quite clear. Um, now, with some of the uh, things that we are attempting to do, quite rightly, uh, we should also realize that uh, going ahead will not be that easy. Uh, because the entire system currently is rooted very heavily in favor of the West, which has to be dominated uh, the global system. Today we have uh, West is in effectively in war with uh, with Russia and uh, considers China as a suitable adversary and then serious tensions in the Western Pacific. In other words, the factions in the world uh, have become deeper and more uh, dangerous. Uh, now, India is uh, in a somewhat uncomfortable position because unlike Russia and China, whose relations with the West, especially the United States, have either collapsed or are in an adversarial mode, our relations with the West, including the United States, are actually intended because that meets uh, our needs for the future. That doesn't mean that this will be at the cost of our relation, either or the global south. But nevertheless, uh, we have to navigate in a manner that uh, while we promote a mutually beneficial agenda, it should not take the form of an anti west agenda. But that will then fracture the world even more and uh, will be a blow to multilateralism. The whole idea of multilateralism is to convince in the West that they should reconcile themselves to the shifts in power and have more consultations and give more concessions to the important priorities of, uh, of the rest of the world. But if we against the West, then we will be in a more difficult situation uh, in multilateral. Uh, because the tendency then to fix, fix would be to join us together 
two positions, uh, which would invariably then be acting with this uh, model. So our view of this would be that we have a very positive agenda. We must push on that agenda. There are certain issues with regard to the governance of the rest of the global financial system, its use of sanctions, uh, the role of uh, the dollar, the hegemony of the dollar, uh, the weaponization of, uh, of the financial system by the uh, United States. Uh, all these are very serious issues which affect our own interests going into the future. But we have to have a realistic basis on how to progress on these matters. There are definitely difficulties down the road uh, because uh, you know, alternative to the SWIFT system or living in our national currency or having the uh, you know, virtual currency and all. These are extremely complex issues. And then you go in national currencies. It is possible to do that in the case of Russia and China because their trade is roughly balanced. What China exports to Russia, Russia exports to China, and therefore they can deal with these uh, with these transactions uh, in the national currency. But when there is an imbalance, where one country is exporting a lot but importing very little. As in the case of Russia, the surplus is at what stuck in India because of the sanction problem. And we can't utilize the systems of payment that existed in the past, continue our trade, and we have to get around. The other, of course, is that even though you may trade in national policy, but there has to be a reference point because the value of the currencies of our own currency uh, in relation to the dollar keeps changing. So the dollar invariably comes in as a reference point. Which is why President Putin has talked about the gold becoming uh, the reference point, or commodities becoming the reference point. These might be positive ideas going ahead, but I think they get realized uh, so quickly. And then again, and the finally, I would say that uh, to my mind, uh, the weakness uh, is uh, the India-China problem. And our relations uh, are now very difficult and difficult to foresee how we can uh, develop them, how we can resolve the problems that uh, we are facing. And since uh, India, China, and Russia are the original, original founders, of what was RIC and then became BRIC and then became BRICS, and the whole exercise started on the basis that China and Russia will work together. Uh, India, whatever we are talking about, India and the rest of the BRICS countries, whether whether members or partners, will work together, but India and China. Uh, find it very difficult to work together because our geopolitical interests are clashing, quite apart from our national issues. Uh, building a consensus on, uh, on, on the issues on the table of books is uh, not easy. Uh, so of course, we have big sites and everything else, and India China relations have been what they are. But if you are going to develop the agenda, and deepen the agenda uh, more seriously and give it teeth, uh, then uh, I think uh, especially between uh, India and China, uh, have to become more stable. And finally, you know, we brought in uh, Iran and uh, UAE and Egypt, uh, of course, Ethiopia. Uh, now, what has happened is that uh, uh, the regional problems of these countries uh, have become, will become or will become part of the BRICS agenda. And then uh, we have to take a position uh, on these issues. Here again, from India's point of view, there's a bit of an option because our relations with Israel are good, though we deplore in, in many ways what Israel is doing in terms of disproportionate use of force, uh, killing of civilians, but nevertheless, we have very different. Israel that Iran has, for example. Uh, so 
we are for developing a consensus uh, on west asia beyond formulation uh, which are should be sort of state the normal principles of interstate relations that's not good enough but to have a clear understanding uh, of supporting each other i think that will be a task that uh, we will have to face uh, finally uh, i think the idea of partner countries uh, rather than members is a good thing uh, even though even when uh, selecting partner countries uh, excluding some and including some uh, would create a bit of resentment but we know that last time Nigeria was not included and they were very resentful they were not uh, so uh, it's a halfway house it's best not to have full members uh, it's a good compromise to have partner members even that will generate one final word from my point of view. Uh, I'm not talking about the government of India's position. I don't represent India. I think we should be very clear on one thing, which is that uh, any country which is a member of another military organization should not be should not be joining BRICS, even as a partner. But I have Turkey in mind. It's a NATO country. And if the whole idea of creating bricks was to create a forum which was on block, then I think uh, admitting a member as part of a military force doesn't make any sense. But I think uh, that I would have a lot of interest in bringing the in because of the nature of this. I don't know whether Turkey uh, in the List of them to mention partner countries like this is my personal thought, but I need it. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Sibyl, for that very acute uh, insight into some of the issues uh, animating the expansion, the challenges, and also your point about that. Uh, again, your optimism that the expanded uh, bricks can be leveraged creatively by India. Uh, to increase space for global south and for accelerating reform of global governance which was the original inspiration uh, behind uh, setting up BRICS. Uh, welcome Nicholas, uh, welcome Dr. Victoria Panova, we'll come to you. Uh, now uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ambassador Sanjay Bhattacharya. Uh, Sanjay served as secretary in the Ministry of External Affairs, where he managed key portfolios, including the Arab region, Israel, and diaspora affairs. But more pertinently for this discussion, uh, Sanjay Bhattacharya, Ambassador Bhattacharya served as India's BRICS paper during India's BRICS presidency. He uh, served as India's ambassador to Switzerland, Turkey, and Spain, and Egypt. Of these uh, two countries, one is already a member of BRICS, Egypt, and Turkey, as Ambassador Sibyl say, the opinion is divided. We don't know how it will play out. So my uh, two questions uh, uh, for you, uh, Ambassador Bhattacharya, is number one, uh, that, you know, as many uh, members, new members of BRICS are from the Middle East, and probably there are going to be more, and Arab Africa as well. Does it mean greater focus of BRICS on crisis and conflicts in the Middle East? That's some sort of regionalization, you know, where uh, you have greater focus on one region more than the other. And uh, second, uh, briefly, you know, what opportunities does uh, BRICS expansion present for uh, India's economic diplomacy? You know, trade and investment, promoting use of national currencies, uh, you know, payment mechanism, which is being worked out, some of these economic issues, which is like the real hardware of the, the emerging BRICS. Uh, over to you, Ambassador Bhattacharya. Sound, sound. Can't hear. Anil? Anil, can you speak? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can, am I? Yeah. yeah, yeah, now, now you're audible. Yes, yes. Uh, Manish, thank you very much for inviting me to this very timely um, seminar uh, on the BRICS uh, as we move towards the summit in a few days. And ministers already making arrangements for 
being in Kazan for what's going to be a very, very exciting uh, BRICS moment. Um, best wishes to, uh, to Russia, who always managed to steer uh, the BRICS movement very, very competently. And I heard very carefully about uh, the comments that Ambassador Alipov made. I'm also particularly delighted to see uh, my old friend uh, Anil Suklal uh, on this forum. Uh, great to see you here. And uh, uh, Foreign Secretary uh, Ambassador Sibyl, uh, thanks for your comments. Uh, Manish, the kind of issues that you brought up, uh, let me take up the first one, uh, the second one first. You know, BRICS was uh, born in the 21st century as a grouping of emerging economies. And its key priority at the very early days was really to bring about the economic development and the linkages with the North uh, or the OECD and others uh, that did not exist. So that was, in a sense, leading to the global, global governance issues. And I think in many ways, the BRICS movement was so successful, uh, although this was very less publicized, that it attracted the attention of many in the region. And after all, this was quite natural because the original BRICS members were not only middle powers, but the leading countries in their regions. And so what they did and what they could do was not only for themselves, but for the regions around them. And in a sense, I think from the very outset, they represented the regions. And this became more evident as the, the NDB, the BRICS Bank, so to say, uh, began the process of expansion where many of the regional countries were brought in. And so economics, and as Ambassador Alipov had also mentioned, we have as many as about 20 sectoral working groups which work on different aspects of economic cooperation. We've seen how we have moved ahead on trade and investment, uh, how we have worked on technology transfers, uh, how we've been able to bring about collaborations between BRICS members on a diverse range of issues from industry to agriculture to health and so on. And this obviously gives it a certain vibrancy. And that has been a uh, focus of many ways. But I think as everyone else mentioned, uh, the, uh, the world became more complex, not least by the fact that conflict became uh, a fact of life in different parts of the world. And so BRICS had to pay attention, both in the uh, NSA's uh, the security advances level, as well as when the foreign ministers uh, would meet, and of course, at the summit itself as well. And so the geopolitics of uh, the world of regional issues became central. For India, right from the outset, I think this has been a great for the our economic diplomacy and our agenda. Uh, uh, we have this understanding which we had uh, brought up during, uh, you know, uh, Prime Minister Modi's presidency of BRICS a few years ago, uh, when we brought this idea of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, of making the world as one family in which we bring together the ideas uh, of economic development, which is both inclusive and spread out to everybody. And, and that has given us the ability uh, to, to take this forward. So today, what we have is through the NDB, the finance that we have within the BRICS mechanism, we've uh, now brought about structures uh, which enable us to have uh, trade in local currencies. We are working on a settlement mechanism which will actually further give leverage to this. Uh, the, the kind of currency reserve, when you have uh, disaster situations, emergency situations, the currency reserve arrangements that we worked out, uh, and just all add leverage to this. Uh, further, I think because the multilateral system is a kind of, um, of coma, if I may say, and the WTO is not making much headway, uh, there is great uh, 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 possibility of individual BRICS countries or regions coming together for FTA kind of arrangements. You know, it has already done one uh, with the United Arab Emirates. Uh, we can do this with others. And so can others uh, in the absence of the progress on the multilateral front. Uh, the uh, other part of, uh, uh, of BRICS movement on the economic front is that uh, we had advanced the idea of digital physical infrastructure. Uh, and these public goods that we've created actually provide the technological advantage to leapfrog the stages of development, to have a more transparent mechanism 
so that your uh, your distribution network becomes much more efficient. And this is something that has worked extremely well in India to bring about the inclusive growth that we have been working on. And it has attracted the attention of many, uh, not just in the BRICS countries, but also in the other parts of the world. And they are now looking for this. So we could share this, but also at the same time, what uh, the BRICS collaboration on the digital front would be is that many of our BRICS partners are actually at the cutting edge of uh, the data systems, the data developments, digital movements, uh, the new developments on artificial intelligence. And our collaboration on the in the digital space would give us the kind of flexibility and the ability to leverage our progress much further. Now, Manish, coming to the last question, which you had raised initially about the Middle East and the issues over there. You know, uh, the BRICS movement has uh, very seriously discussed uh, regional and global issues, including those pertaining to security. And in fact, uh, we have a very robust mechanism for discussion on the Middle East issues at the deputy minister's level, which is which then provides its inputs uh, to the summit itself. And so we have been discussing this for a very long period of time. And we have noticed how uh, the incidence of violence, of fundamentalism, of terrorism has in some ways had some of the roots in this part of the region uh, and has spread across, though it is not in this region and is in many other parts of the world as well. My, my understanding has been, and till now what we've done is that uh, we have been studying this and having consultations, but we have not really waded deep into uh, the conflict situations themselves. Uh, what we do expect in, in the future as well is that we would not do so in the future because BRICS, uh, while it focuses on economics and while it discusses uh, the geopolitical issues, does not get into the uh, the integrity of those in terms of mediation or no solutions because those are far more completely tracked from the very core idea of what what, what is trying to do. But it is another thing because now so many of the countries in what is also known as the MENA region are now becoming more actively involved in the BRICS movement. What I do anticipate is that the kind of economic benefits, the kind of integration that is going to happen, the, the integration to supply and value chains that will happen is that we will find uh, a greater chance of stability and economic growth for meeting the aspirations of the people. And that would, in a sense, in a way, create the conditions uh, that would provide uh, a, a more stable and durable basis for peace and stability in the region, because uh, that does have an impact not only on the region, uh, but beyond. Uh, overall, uh, I would conclude by saying that I'm very excited about uh, the developments in BRICS. I am excited about the fact that uh, BRICS is expanding uh, and it is having this two-tier system. I, I am in consonance with Anil's assessment on this. I don't think it should become too unwieldy because consensus cooperation, uh, which are, uh, uh, you know, at the heart of the BRICS movement uh, is something that we need to do and maintain in order to have efficacy in the delivery. Uh, so that it remains something that the other countries look forward to as well. Uh, thank you, Sanjay, for that very eloquent uh, uh, expression of uh, optimism in the future of BRICS, the expanded BRICS, and what it can achieve, especially as a force for uh, enhanced economic engagement, economic integration, uh, and rejuvenation. You know, in, in other words, it is like uh, an expanded BRICS could serve as a, as a platform for rejuvenating the economic uh, economies of BRICS countries and the larger BRICS family. Uh, now we move on to Dr. Victoria Panova. Uh, Dr. Victoria. Panova is a seasoned diplomat uh, who served, uh, sorry, he is a provost for international relations at Far Eastern Federal University. And he served as scientific supervisor of the BRICS Expert Council uh, during BRICS chairmanship. Uh, Dr. Panova has led civil society initiatives like Civil BRICS and Axis Russia's Women 20 Shape, WT. Uh, 20 shape. Uh, 
Uh, Dr. Banova, I mean, you know, we're talking about expansion and all that, but, uh, you know, half the, as they say, half the sky, we're talking about women. Uh, what can BRICS do? Uh, this expanded BRICS uh, to put greater focus on uh, gender equality, women empowerment, uh, and also, how do you see? Because, you know, one of the things that has always intrigued me about BRICS is even though when it is a club of five, uh, about uh, the civil society linkages are not very strong. Uh, human uh, people to people contacts. I mean, we need to understand each other's society, culture better. What is your take? I mean, especially, you see, for example, India G20 presidency had women empowerment as a very important theme. How do you see uh, BRICS driving women empowerment issues, you know, uh, setting agenda on that? Over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, that's really great to see uh, my colleagues and old friends, uh, Your Excellency, Dr. Alipa, uh, Professor Nelson Klau, Your Excellency, um, gentlemen, really good to be here. And um, in fact, a small correction before I start. Um, in fact, you are talking about my position four years ago. Okay. <laughs> I'm Hi. now there, uh, like similar position, but in Moscow, HSC University. And uh, yes, I remain uh, women 20 Sherpa for Russia. And also, um, there, um, there is a newly uh, recreated expert council, which was created by the order of Prime Minister of Russia. Uh, this year uh, on a permanent basis because before I was heading um, the council that was just four year of presidency but it turned out to be a good experience and that uh, it is very uh, it is necessary to have uh, you know team of people who are dedicated to uh, first of all developing track to diplomacy but also providing uh, yes. and timely and valuable expertise for, uh, you know, our governments and to provide for those uh, connectivity. Um, so, uh, with the questions you asked, um, not that I enjoyed very Hello? much when uh, what you think about women's issues. No, no, I don't want to talk to you about more. I don't want to talk to you about more. I don't want Sorry. Sure. Um, and uh, with BRICS, yes, Women 20 is a bit different. With BRICS, we have Women Business Alliance. And it's in a way like a part, very uh, autonomous part of the BRICS Business Council. And um, frankly, I don't see extra necessity in order to Mm, single out those issues separately and to make like women bricks or uh, create anything else. I can explain. Um, issues of women empowerment, they were part of the G20 main agenda for India. It's not something separate that women have to read. We're talking not just about women, we're talking about women and men born equal, having equal opportunities, and going directions they, the, and paths they're choosing to and having the right to do so. And we're not uh, employing or uh, undertaking any other discourse. And uh, that is why whenever we talk in BRICS as a whole, in civil BRICS or in academic forum in the BRICS Think Tank Council, we're talking about uh, general uh, provision for uh, human rights, economic rights of men and women. And this is important because um, we need to go for equality in opportunities and then ability at the same time to choose your own path, uh, to keep to your own traditions, your religions, and uh, not break your personality. 
So this is vital that we don't introduce universal model. And in fact, and I think many speakers talked about it because this is part of the core principle for BRICS. BRICS is not about following the Western model. It is not anti-West in any way, no. It is non-West. And it talks about its own needs, its own agendas and interests. And uh, that is why we can be talking about it in complexity in, in a comprehensive manner, because we do respect each other's uh, differences, diversities, uh, we respect uh, each other's approaches, cultures, civilizational uh, my, mindset. This is all there. And it's key for us that we work together on a principle of mutual uh, understanding and mutual respect. And no universal model can be kind of pushed by anybody onto the BRICS members, be it the earlier five or the current expanded format. And uh, in fact, I think this is what uh, makes us much stronger because while being different, we're not working, let's say, unlike G7. I don't like those comparisons, but I mean, <laughs> it comes to mind because we don't work on a hierarchical model our leaders and on each every uh, layer of negotiation of each track, it's a kind of a discussion of equals who come to consensus. It could be a difficult path. Uh, some issues could be put aside because our, and, and it was already discussed here because our interests are not identical be it in economic area or be it, let's say, uh, in, in uh, regional uh, security, etc. But what is important that the core principles, both in economic development, in equal and sustainable and fair development, we do share. And uh, this is how we work. So it's, it's key for BRICS. That is why we can allow ourselves to uh, be discussing issues like this within official track, if needed. And of course, countries on a different path for providing for women's rights. We, uh, we have the legacy of the Soviet Union, who was the pioneer in terms of uh, introducing uh, full equality uh, legally to men and women. In fact, much, much earlier before any Western country with the voting rights or, you know, or right to work. Um, and this is important that we're just sharing best practices, but not dictating that this or that model should be undertaken. Uh, but what we could be doing as women, and in fact, we're doing it informally uh, since the inception of the Women 20 format, we do some informal consultations uh, within, um, within their Women 20. Because um, it is true that our partners from the other side, from the West, they are always very consolidated and they do follow one line. And so you need to have um, extra strength and you need friends in order to uh, to be able to uh, stick to your points sometimes it could be difficult that's why we do uh, informal consultations like that that's on women uh with regards to civil society uh, thank you for reminding that yes it, uh, we did it we started it in russia uh like in 2015 at their two presidencies before two chairships before and um, that's another, by the way, distinct feature for BRICS. Uh, BRICS is extremely open to dialogue, not only between countries, but also within countries. 
um, because I've been looking at club formats uh, since the inception. Um, over 20 years, I have experience in researching that. And um, with their G7, at some point G8, it took um, 25, 30 years to acknowledge that civil society matters and that you have to talk to them. Because uh, at the beginning, it was kind of the meetings were all closed, just some short notice in newspapers. Uh, then civil society wanting to know more about what's happening behind the doors. Uh, started different movements, including anti-globalist movements, so there were problems. And only then, in fact, when Russia was inside, and it, when it was Russia's chairship in 2006, we started the civil process. It was the first time uh, that we gathered civil society from uh, G8 plus countries, uh, about 1,000 people all together, and talking to Vladimir Putin. And uh, it was a very open dis and frank discussion. And we had the possibility and ability to um, give a, tell our news not only to him, but also to all their Sherpas. That was first time. And uh, in fact, when it was next Germany's chairship, uh, participants of our year said that they were not expecting that our process would be so much more democratic and open because it was it started being restricted after that so and then in BRICS, while there could be different discourse with regards to us as members by by uh, other countries but uh, we are open and i know that our government is open i know your government is open to such consultations and we have very uh, productive discussions both with rias with um orf who are seen as focal points for 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 those tracks but there are also other institutions involved and i know that this year they um and a group of civil society activists from BRICS they started a civil BRICS council in order to kind of to ensure that it remains a process always on the agenda. We know that during Brazilian chairship, sometimes this aspect is lost for some reason. And next one would be Brazil. So uh, there is a real, real uh, strive. And I think we heard that this has to continue. Um, and we had this... Um, uh, ability uh, to offer uh, our recommendations and in fact to to see what we need inside the leaders discussion and um, I think this is extremely important uh, because if um, BRICS is not exclusive it is inclusive club from outside and from inside uh, it is difficult on the one hand to, to agree because we're very diverse. So the more countries, the more laborious and continuous process it is of negotiations. But at the same time, it gives us uh, extra skills that are not lost with any of the BRICS countries. Uh, in fact, unlike some others, we have this culture of negotiation and we know how to respectfully agree to the issues uh, that we could have different approaches to. But the same applies, and that's why we are talking about further expansion, or let's say different format to ensure efficiency, because uh, the circle of partners, um, we cannot just leave it un unnoticed, unresponded. We need. We are talking about ourselves as a defender of interests or vanguard, or or I, I prefer the word core of um, global south and east, global majority. You can use any term. 
uh, but we need to not just to be within our small pot. And that is why we're open to discussion with other countries and to expansion as it is. Albeit there could be for the sake of efficiency and, and, and the group, we need to be looking into formats that would ensure that uh, it stays relevant. But the same applies to the insight. We have very, very rich uh, network of different track to diplomacy um, uh, events. And in fact, each of them enriches uh, the official process a lot. And this is also key to us because this way we um, we can be finding, uh, you know, it's, it's a very difficult moment now, geopolitical tensions, uh, but I believe because of this specificity, because of, of this openness, uh, because of this design ability to listen, inside, outside, BRICS is the only institutional mechanism, because it's not an organization, that could be offering an alternative of the new, fairer world that is so much weighted and aspired for by uh, the, the developing countries. And, and we cannot fail them because we need to keep up. Thank you so much. You're muted. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much uh, for your remarks. And uh, you know, your especially a uh, couple of points, very important points you made, which is the BRICS is uh, non-West not anti-West. And that's a very important. And more countries, more skills. But more importantly, when we talk about the expansion, uh, BRICS is offering uh, uh, an alternative vision of a fairer world. I think that's well taken. Uh, we will now move to our... Uh, thank you. We will now move to our next speaker. Uh, uh, Nicholas, some problem Hello. Yeah, so we now move to our next speaker, uh, Nicholas uh, Bushu. He is uh, co-founder and president of the Grand Paris Alliance of Metropolitan Development, a think tank focused on sustainable urban planning. He is also a fellow of Global Solutions Initiative. He coaches E20 Task Force on Urban Infrastructure, infrastructure Investment. Uh, so... Uh, you know, with his background, you know, this is also an important part of BRICS, you know, and this was a very prominent part of the agenda, at least in the earlier years. Uh, what can uh, BRICS do to promote sustainable infrastructure, infrastructure development? And uh, my second question to you is, uh, now that we'll have an expanded BRICS, where do you see convergence uh, between BRICS and G20? Nicholas has worked a lot on G20, so that would be an important perspective. You have around six, seven, eight minutes to offer your take. Over to you, Nicholas. <clears throat> Anish, thank you very much. I hope the sound is okay. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I will try to be even shorter because uh, uh, we have been listening to such uh, fantastic and great insights uh, from high-level speakers, and then I feel very humbled. Um, but the, uh, you forgot to mention that I have also been appointed as a senior fellow at RIS in Delhi, right? Yeah, so oh, yes. I feel also, <laughs> I feel also ah, far yes. somehow you, of the brief. You wear many hats, you know. Yes, very much. <laughs> think, yeah. think, thanks, think thanks, family. Um, yeah. I have just a few, a very few remarks. The first one, um, also listening to our previous colleague, I think the issue of culture and cultural exchange and cultural interchange across the BRICS and across the new countries that might be new members or new partners uh, across the BRICS is something that uh, should, sh should not be undervalued. On the contrary, it is an extremely important resource. And uh, we were together just a few days ago in Tashkent in Central Asia for the, first, for the fourth World Conference on a Creative Economy. And uh, they were uh, nearly all the BRICS and future BRICS partner countries uh, represented, and we could feel how productive it is 
to be able to uh, discuss about uh, such issues uh, in an open context. So that's the first remark. The second remark about your very question about uh, infrastructure systems and investments into infrastructure. Indeed, I have been uh, uh, um, uh, lucky to be co-chairing the T20 task force uh, on those issues in the G20 uh, over the past uh, seven years, and including this year in Brazil, which is included in the uh, climate issues. Uh, here, um, I think um, there is a, a before and an after of the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And uh, before the COVID-19 crisis, 2018, 2019, even 2020, somehow, um, the approach in the G20 about uh, uh, promoting investment into both physical and digital infrastructure, including also energy systems, uh, was uh, very global and was about how to support and sustain growth. And then uh, it became also how to support sustainable growth in light of uh, mounting issues linked with uh, excessive CO2 emissions and environmental uh, transformations that are detrimental uh, for us as, as humans. And then there was the COVID. And then after the COVID, suddenly um, uh, we rediscovered somehow that there were different approaches uh, to promoting infrastructure systems, including across the G20, be it the uh, Belt and Road Initiative and its uh, kind of second generation from China, be it the Partnership for Global Infrastructure Initiatives, and be it other ways uh, to look at infrastructure systems. I think in the context of now, uh, the issue of infrastructure uh, does not escape the kind of uh, fragmented uh, geoeconomics or geopolitics that were described by the previous speakers. And hence, um, this makes the issue of how to continue uh, cooperating, dialoguing, especially among think tanks uh, within the G20 uh, with the BRICS and a number of organizations, they are the same, whether we think about India or uh, South Africa uh, next year or Brazil this year, uh, there is here a kind of imperative that the quality of the exchange and discussions among think tanks about the positive and negative spillover of infrastructure systems, about the definition of future infrastructure systems, um, is uh, being constantly assessed and reassessed, not just within uh, different, I would say, uh, economic systems or geopolitical spheres, but across them. And then the third remark that I would like to share today, uh, and thank you again, Manish, for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak here, uh, would be about what for, in the sense that uh, we can see, we could see this year with the adoption of the Pact of the Future at the United Nations, that nearly 30% or 35% of the countries which are affiliated to the UN uh, did not approve uh, the pact for the future, either by not voting, by voting against, or by abstention. And last year, we could see that somehow a similar pattern uh, was, uh, a play, was at play uh, with the assessment of the SDGs. And next year, there will be two important meetings about development finance, uh, that would be before summer in Spain, and about the second World Summit on Development, which is due to take place in Qatar in November. So the thinking is how together across the different, I would say, politi political or policy spaces uh, which are emerging or which are being affirmed, uh, we can continue uh, to discuss, not to forget about a couple of uh, global goals that do not belong to any specific region of the world, but which are kind of common goods or public goods uh, for all of humanity. And here, I think uh, issues of infrastructure systems as expressions of, of, of course, of global trade issues, uh, supply chain issues, but also production and consumption systems could be part of this uh, global approach or uh, a multilateral or across different geoeconomic spheres approach uh, to thinking about where we will be in 2030 uh, with the uh, 2030 agenda and how to build the next steps 
of the aftermath of 2030. And I have great hopes that within the extraordinary momentum uh, within the BRICS, uh, very strong uh, new ideas might come up, right? Not just looking into the mirror and saying we need to apply the same uh, recipes that have prevailed in the past 30 years, especially uh, after the end of the Cold War, but uh, looking at a new reservoirs of uh, sources of investments, uh, culturally sensitive investments, but also investments that would make sense uh, in the context that has been described by the previous speakers. And uh, because you kindly underlined also the uh, small experience I've gathered over the years uh, working especially in India or in China or in the Russian Federation and elsewhere about urban transformations and urban issues. Of course, that should be part of the equation. And this might be right now uh, the opportunity to overcome a little bit the rationale of global urbanization as uh, we have known it in the past few years or in the past 30 years and craft something different. So this would be uh, the Amanish my few remarks. And uh, what exactly is happening? Uh, okay, now we move on to the we move on to the last speaker, Panjan Roy Chaudhary. Uh, last but not the least, is diplomatic editor at the Economic Times. He has been covering foreign affairs, international relations for many, many years. And, uh, he has covered many multilateral summits, including BRICS. Uh, uh, previously, he was program directed at Aspen India Institute, what we made today, Kuwait New Agency, to many other organizations. Uh, more importantly, the Bajan is the one who is right there on the ground in many ways. He will be traveling to Kazan. I will also be there uh, at uh, the summit in Kazan. Uh, so, Dipanjan, uh, my question to you uh, uh, is this, that uh, how do you look at these, uh, you know, what is the buzz you're hearing about the expansion as, as, a, as a journalist writing, chronicling and reporting every day? What is the buzz? Do you think there is uh, enthusiasm about expansion? Also, how is the West looking at it? Is the West uncomfortable with this expanded BRICS, number one? Uh, number two, you may like to also focus on uh, uh, does this expansion work for India? As in, uh, you know, uh, these are friendly countries. Most of these countries, we have excellent relations with them. Almost all of them, I would say. So over to you, Dipanjan. Are you there? Can you? Hello. Hello. Well, the Panjan, are you there? Yeah, I'm there very much there. Yeah, yeah, he's coming. Yeah, you heard the questions? No. Can you repeat? I think it got. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, okay. There was some issue. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the Panjan, uh, basically, my question is that as. You're covering this on a day-to-day -day basis also, and you will be in Kazan for the summit. And uh, what is the buzz you hear about the expansion? I mean, what, are, what do others have to say? Uh, also, is there an unease among the Western countries, the West, about this expansion? And uh, what is your view about the new members? Do they, or members which are expected to be in the new expanded BRICS, does it work for India? I mean, they are friendly countries mostly, but what is your take overall? Yeah, um, I guess the buzz about BRICS um, in Indian media is uh, very limited, uh, in my opinion. Uh, you know, generally, it only revolves around uh, the summit, whenever the summit happens. And um, uh, uh, because it's not in India, so the buzz is, is, is limited like... The buzz about G20 is limited because it's being held in a faraway uh, country uh, in Brazil. 
So the buzz about this is limited. Also, uh, I feel that um, uh, many uh, journalists or columnists have not of late focused on BRICS um, in the last, um, say, five years in the, in the post-COVID period. While there has been a move to make BRICS a more cohesive organization, and uh, the, the, uh, unfortunately, the, the uh, percentage of space uh, devoted in media to BRICS has reduced in India. Um, I mean, there could be a multiplicity of reasons uh, uh, because of India's unease with one of the uh, member, one of the one of the founding members. Uh, you know, there are there are bilateral irritants uh, or differences in one of the relationships. So it it, it may have overshadowed. Uh, but nonetheless, um, I think uh, uh, there is a lot of curiosity about the BRICS partner mechanism, as we would call it. And uh, this would, in uh, in my understanding, this would be essentially a partner mechanism uh, for the time being, and uh, which will also be uh, discussed in the next summit. It, it may not uh, translate immediately into membership uh, and um, it might take few years, may not take few years, depending on, on the dynamics. But definitely I have noticed uh, over the last uh, one year uh, a lot of interest in, in, uh, in uh, BRICS uh, uh, from uh, various countries, particularly in Southeast Asia, uh, from where I think there is a maximum uh, push to become a uh, BRICS partner, this includes Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia is also uh, present in, 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 the, in the BRICS outreach. Uh, I think the new Indonesian foreign minister is, is traveling, which shows the interest because Indonesian, a new Indonesian president will only be sworn in on Sunday. And his uh, foreign minister is a floor eight, eight, eight of the president will be traveling within two days uh, to Kazan, which is not very close to, geographically not very close to, uh, not very close to, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, Indonesia. Uh, so uh, I, I think that uh, there is a growing interest yeah. in, in, um, in, in Africa and Latin America. You know, and uh, one interesting I found is, is, is Morocco. I mean, you know, uh, because Algeria is interested, maybe Morocco is also showing interest to be part of, um, uh, part of, or at least take part in this deliberation, because Algeria is, a, is an old partner of, of Soviet Union and Russia. Um, Algeria, India, Algeria also relations are good. India, Morocco relations have also improved uh, over the years. Uh, so Morocco has shown some interest, at least in my opinion, in, 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 uh, is interesting. Um, so, and, and uh, from an Indian viewpoint, I think the, this is a, a platform uh, which takes forward India's agenda for Global South. Uh, you know, we have had three voices of the Global South. Uh, uh, Global South... Uh, 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 summit and this this uh, takes forward um, the the, the uh, BRICS would provide and, and this would become a platform for the global south because you know the major criteria for BRICS is emerging economies and I believe it's not just emerging economies it's also the middle powers Indonesia uh, Kazakhstan uh, you know Turkey Algeria uh, Morocco Nigeria um, uh, Colombia, I mean, Colombia was interested uh, to come. I, I'm not too sure what is the status of Colombia as of now, uh, but whether they're invited uh, or not. So there are a lot of middle powers, there are aspirational powers, who for some reason, uh, you know, some of them became members of the UN only in the 90s, some have been members of the UN for many, many years, who in, uh, for, for many, many reasons uh, have not brought the voice in other um, other, other uh, platforms, established platforms. That's A. And B, uh, um, I went by saying that, uh, referring to uh, Mr. Ali Pop's uh, 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 speech and, uh, and um, Mr. Sanjay Bhattacharya and, and uh, others, uh, and, and reference by, by uh, uh, Dr. Victoria Panova, is the attraction of the BRICS uh, bank. I think the BRICS Bank, the uh, New Development Bank, is 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 something which which is attractive because uh, uh, lending from other financial institutions may not be easy, and sometimes there are conditions attached to the BRICS Bank. Uh, but you know, one has to see the capital of the BRICS Bank for future uh, projects. Uh, 
And I would completely agree with, uh, I, with uh, Dr. Panova that uh, uh, BRICS is not against anyone. It is, it is not anti-West. Uh, it, it, it is rather providing a platform for many countries, which, which, which may actually influence uh, other formations uh, to, to probably do some course correction. Uh, in terms of uh, you know attracting uh, attracting many middle powers, you know we are actually in the in the era of multipolarity. Uh, you know many countries, of course, may not may not have their currency as a global currency, but uh, it, it's an era of multipolarity uh, where middle powers want to make their presence felt, and BRICS uh, provides that platform uh, in the, in the coming years. All right. Okay. Thanks, Dipanjit. That's a very realistic uh, uh, take on where BRICS is heading and what uh, does the addition of uh, new members mean for the grouping as well as for India. Uh, so with this, we complete the, the, the round where speakers had uh, made their presentations, a remarkable presentation, very insightful. We have uh, some questions uh, now uh, for the speakers. In the interest of time, we'll take Maybe three or four of them are all speakers here. Ambassador, uh, uh, Mr. Babushkin, are you there? Very much. Hello. Oh, you're very much there. Okay. So there is a question for you uh, 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 from, uh, let me read out to you. One is uh, from uh, Elena, a journalist from TARS, about can BRICS initiate a peace plan on Ukraine? And this question is also addressed to uh, uh, can BRICS, the summit in Kajan, or BRICS as such, can they come out with a peace plan on, on, on the Ukraine uh, crisis, conflict? And this question is also addressed to uh, Professor Anil Suklal, that what role can uh, BRICS uh, uh, play uh, in, as a peacemaker in conflicts, not just Ukraine, but Gaza? So these are the two questions. Uh, for two. Over to you, Mr. Babushkin. Thank you very much, Manish. And um, I'm really honored to be part of this um, uh, prominent uh, gathering. And um, all of the speakers uh, were, to some extent, very close to us. Uh, either I was you know, working in the, as the Russia BRICS team at some point of time, uh, with the uh, Honorable Dr. Suklal as you know, prominent uh, uh, BRICS Sherpa of South Africa, or uh, His Excellency Mr. Sanjay Bhadacharya as BRICS Sherpa. And uh, uh, well, uh, uh, I'm really, uh, it's really a privilege, and it's a privilege to have Ambassador Suklal here in Delhi as well. Uh, welcome here, Your Excellency. Uh, so looking forward to, so to closer interaction with you here as well. Um, so, um, uh, BRICS, uh, well, uh, what is the big and, you know, very positive thing about BRICS is uh, everything which has been mentioned uh, during today's uh, very interesting deliberations and forward-looking uh, visions of uh, uh, well, how we see BRICS and how it works and uh, what are the options, uh, are all of them are true. Because uh, well, we, we don't have a, a, it's not a structured organization. So this is an intergovernmental forum, which provides a, a platform for exchange of opinions and find a common ground on uh, what we are interested to do together. Uh, it's about um, um, a matter of a goodwill, and it's about a matter of uh, you know how we move towards uh, so many tracks of our uh, practical interaction because uh, it's not only about um, some um, you know consensus on critical issues like the united nations uh, security council expansion or something so well uh, along with that we have uh, uh, more than 70 tracks of uh, practical cooperation which also moves on irrespective of on uh, uh, whether we agree on some things or not so um but again uh, that makes, makes even uh, you know, stronger, and I do agree with uh, Dr. Victoria because uh, that you know, makes makes it you know, very uh, powerful and even uh, more efficient uh, structure than um, a formal organization. Because so well, we do whatever we agree upon, 
and if not of course we we, we keep working on that so that to, to find a, a solution that's a big value that's a big value and the common uh, goodwill to achieve the uh, consensus as far as um, uh, the global issues is concerned of course BRICS uh, uh, as a global body it deals with everything and certainly it's a good platform to discuss any any issue and uh, um, along with that all the uh, major uh, global challenges uh, including the regional crisis including the conflict in Ukraine as well will be very much part of uh, the agenda but it doesn't mean that uh, we should have some uh, expectations that uh, you know we uh, together would work out some uh, real uh, peace plan for for the settlement because uh, we truly believe that it's um, um, it, it, it is very valuable that we have an opportunity to listen to each other and to you know take note and to probably you know uh, deliberate on that and you know, take take best of the offers which are being expressed at the, this uh, well-reputed platform however in order to for any peace plan to to work uh, it is necessary to have the two sides on board uh, because uh, uh, you know um uh, what uh, we um, witness throughout the recent years of uh, the uh, ukrainian crisis because um, it, it started not in just 2022 it started much earlier uh, what we have started in 2022, it's a special military operation designed to, to end this conflict. So, uh, but when, um, you know, well, we started this special military operation, we were very close to the uh, solution uh, and uh, negotiations were almost over as early as in April 2022. Um, uh, until uh, Boris Johnson came to, to Kyiv and uh, told the Ukrainians to stop talking to Russians. So um, um, after that, they have uh, worked out uh, the, the so-called uh, peace formula by Zelensky, which doesn't accept any kind of a compromise uh, with others. Uh, uh, they, it, it represents just an ultimatum against Russia without you know, any take of a realistic you know, um, uh, situation. And uh, uh, whatever peace plans were all, all, all already offered, to Ukrainians, um, uh, like the African countries, were uh, you know well, were working on something. Then the Chinese and Brazilian uh, proposals were also on the table. They, all them, uh, all of them were rejected. Uh, uh, on the other side, they have conducted this vigilant peace conference without uh, inviting Russia uh, or without uh, taking uh, into account the Russian interests and concerns which you know uh, made this uh, peace conference just a um, uh, um, sort of uh, um, um, uh, just um, imitation imitation of the peace process at the same time they have chosen the way of escalation of the crisis while keeping supplying uh, you know, weapons to 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 to, uh, to ukraine and uh, um um projecting uh, another uh, peace formula which is uh, uh, again the uh, just a set of uh, the unrealistic ultimatums and actually just they are just selling the sovereignty of the country um we cannot talk to ukrainians because they don't belong to themselves uh because this is a puppet government and uh, um um uh, until there is a you know a more common ground between um, the major players which are around this uh, Ukrainian crisis, we we are unable to to, to move towards uh, the lasting uh, solution. So um, of course um, it it is a, a big value and a big opportunity to listen to uh, other uh, leaders which are uh, who are uh, who are present at the BRICS summit either in the BRICS format or the BRICS plus or outreach so that uh, well you could really uh, exchange the opinions but the big value is that um the um the majority of, uh, of those countries who will be present at uh, the BRICS summit will speak almost in one voice uh, uh referring to the need of uh, all of the participants of the conflict to be at the table and uh, um, without mutual goodwill between them there is not much point 
to produce ADP's formula, which will be rejected. Uh, you're almost sure about that. So uh, I would like to especially highlight the importance of the um, um, Indian balanced position since we are dealing with the, the Indian side here in Delhi and uh, must appreciate its balanced view and its neutral position. And um, this is a, um, a big contribution uh, to the uh, understanding of the global community and uh, to those who are trying to impose any kind of, uh, you know, uh, ultimatums that it will not go through. So, and uh, um, with this understanding in mind, of course, we will move towards uh, the uh, strengthening the um, uh, common vision and common voice uh, among the BRICS countries and the Global South countries, since we um, also can say that uh, BRICS is, uh, is becoming uh, an important and efficient mechanism of uh, uh, promoting the interests of the Global South countries. That um, um, uh, we sh uh, when, when talking about peace, it's very easy to just say, uh, to, to, to start any peace initiatives of like, uh, you know, we, we, peace should prevail. That's okay, that people should, should, be, should prevail, but how? So that's the major point. So it's not as, as easy as it, you know, it looks so well. And uh, as we see, even those countries who are involved in this conflict uh, directly from other side are uh, not uh, able to do so uh, or not willing to do so. To, to in crisis like uh, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, yes, now. Yeah, what can, uh, thank you, Mr. Babushkin, for your excellent realistic take on what role can the BRICS play. Uh, coming to Professor Suklal, the same question, but with slight improvisation. What can uh, uh, BRICS, the expanded BRICS, do with its increased clout to in, in, in conflicts like Russia, Ukraine, or, or in Gaza? Very briefly, two, three minutes, please. I think uh, it's a very important point to note. If you look at all BRICS from the very first to the most recent in summit, and I'm sure this was done the same. BRICS leaders never indulged in fear pointing and trying to caution them to any country with global. You'll never see that in declarations, unlike, unlike G7 declaration and even this crept into the G20 declaration where countries were fingered and blame apportioned in terms of what's happening on the global scene that we confront. And I think that's a very important point to recognize that BRICS, if you look at the summit declaration, it always speaks when addressing global peace and security issues. It speaks of peaceful resolution of these conflicts through negotiations without pointing fingers. And I think that's the big principle that underlies cooperation bricks amongst ourselves, but what we'd like to see is the larger community. Now, coming specifically to the situation in Western Asia, none of the BRICS countries are both the Ukraine situation and Western Asia situation, suppliers of arms and, arms and finance to fuel. We are not fueling as the BRICS community. The, so it is BRICS that has a peak of finding a peaceful, sustainable uh, solution to the conflict in Gaza, to the situation in Ukraine. But our partners not, are not interested in that. And the double standards that they're constantly trying to address vis a vis the UN Charter, its purposes and principles, and the security that wantonly violated by some countries without any repercussion. The unjust sanction, unilateral sanctions that, in, that is imposed, this is not by any BRICS countries. And I see these are challenges that have to be addressed when one side of the global community is calling for peace 
is calling for a resolution of the while the other are not interested at all in bringing about a peaceful solution be it the situation is not about russia and ukraine we all know this it's and this is the situation in gaza it is i think it must be seen within the larger context of power contest it must be seen within the larger context of a new global order and that is unfolding that being exposed because a certain group of that dominate the global agenda the global political and security situation global economy the global finance they don't want to make new partners that are of the global south and i think all of these conflicts must be seen within this larger context of what is happening on the platform and it cannot be relation and brics has a major force to push for respect of multilateral architecture strength and reinforce multilateralism you system and calling for a transformation on the of the bretton woods uh institutions the, the very architecture the way the un is designed will be next year celebrate 80 years the founding of the un but the un is still caught up in 45 when the world has taken so dramatic this is criticism in taking the lead in crafting a more inclusive global architecture financially political thank you uh sanjay there is a question for you about uh, just very briefly one minute two minute then we'll wind up is we've been there for now almost 100 minutes more than that uh so essentially this question from kartikey gurg center for global india insights uh you know the brics has also opened the possibility of development finance enhanced development finance for uh developing countries you know uh where the britain britain boots institutions fail them you know what is your view i mean is a new development bank catering to the needs of developing countries for the finance uh, infrastructure finance project finance uh, fleet of conditionalities we have seen in the case of bretton woods institution two minutes please uh, no 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 we can't hear you and then which is yeah yeah, yeah. can you hear me Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. I see BRICS as an organization which promotes development, uh, which promotes equity, and in that particular effort, it moves towards global governance, which is more just and equitable. Uh, BRICS alone cannot change global governance, but if it can create the situations where the economic conditions of own citizens and not only of its own citizens. the citizens of the neighboring region uh, who are also part of the global south can be improved that significant benefit that can actually transfer uh, to humanity that the role of the fdb has been very very significant right from the outset ndb was not just for brics countries it was for brics plus it was uh, its projects and its funding was available to a range of countries outside and many of them many of the project were actually in in non brics countries so that's the way that you can share your uh, your uh, idea of plus they want to do you know how you can bring about a common future for the world together i think the bread of the world uh, on set Uh, I, i would not say they failed but i think they haven't matched up to the expectations and i think they need reform we should to continue to plug to i don't think brics is rejecting the multilateral system but what brics is saying is that the multilateral system today is inadequate for the requirements of our times for the aspirations of our citizens and therefore it needs reform And in that context, if the reform doesn't come about right now, we are not going to be waiting, and so we will establish mechanisms and institutions that will provide the benefit to my people. And that's what NDB, for instance, does. That's what many of the BRICS movements and initiatives do. And so these will go in parallel. The 
we have been at it for more than 100 minutes and what an incredibly rich uh, discussion, multi-layer discussion it has been. We could go on probably for another uh, few hours, uh, but somewhere one has to stop. Uh, so uh, as we end this, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not going to dare to summarize this uh, very rich discussion. Just a few takeaways. Uh, uh, number one, that uh, what we saw emerging from this discussion uh, that despite skepticism and despite speculation about hidden agendas behind expansion of the grouping, by and large, I think here the view among all the speakers was that the expansion of BRICS is a, uh, is a positive development, that it is uh, going to enhance the power of BRICS, it is going to enhance space for Global South. Of course, there are issues uh, that needs to be navigated. Uh, uh, cleverly, there needs to be ne negotiated uh, with sensitivity to uh, interest of all other countries. But uh, BRICS 2.0 is set to uh, grow further, consolidate its position in the emerging international order. That is a big takeaway. Uh, also, uh, uh, that uh, even though the BRICS has expanded, uh, and, and despite the addition of new members, which has fueled uh, apprehension about dilution and diffusion of the agenda, uh, probably some things will move with faster pace because uh, uh, the, the expanded BRICS uh, means more numbers. So there is strength in numbers as well. So the original inspiration of BRICS, which is uh, accelerating reform of global governance architecture, global governance institutions, and the archaic uh, uh, institutions like you know United Nations still not meeting the needs and aspirations of developing emerging countries, uh, that will have to change. There are many countries that are knocking to get inside the BRICS tent, and there'll be more coming in. So this process seems to be unstoppable. The challenge uh, uh, looking ahead uh, would be how to uh, have a sense of balance uh, uh, as the BRICS expands and uh, pursues its uh, agenda of uh, renovating the world order uh, to reflect aspirations and interest of the uh, of developing countries emerging economies and brics uh, is going to uh, 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 you know uh, reflect this change world order it's a miniature and all this talk we'll see how it evolves so basically uh, uh, i would like to end on this note that uh, yes uh, we are heading to the kazan summit so there's no point in the speculation, uh, the, the declaration, it, it is said to be a very substantive summit. Let's see what emerges out of it and uh, how to make the most of BRICS, especially at a time when the world is seething with conflicts and crisis, uh, would be something to watch out for. Uh, now, I'd like to thank uh, all our speakers, uh, uh, all our esteemed guests. Uh, Russian ambassador uh, to India, His Excellency uh, Denis Alipo was kind enough uh, to record and send a message, although he could not attend it. Uh, uh, my profuse thanks to uh, 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 Roman Babushkin, Deputy Chief of Mission. Most importantly, uh, and to all of you, Professor Anil Suklal, uh, who's been uh, uh, who has brought some unique insights and very uh, and, uh, and balance and moderation in this discussion with a unique perspective and long years of experience. Ambassador Sanjay Bhattacharya uh, for illuminating different issues. Uh, Nicholas Bushu, Dr. Victoria Panova, Dipanjan Roy Chaudhary. Many, many thanks for joining and hanging on. And above all, a big shout out to our uh, tremendous audience. Many of them who have hung on for those last uh, nearly two hours and followed the discussion. Uh, this just shows that the interest in BRICS is growing and the, the kind of response we got to our conference was quite amazing. And it shows that, uh, you know, that people want to know more about what is this uh, new combination which is emerging? What is this, the future of this grouping? And uh, uh, so the original thing about reforming the world order, creating a world order which is more in sync with new realities, we will see in the coming days. Thank you once again for joining. We will compile the findings uh, of this. We will prepare a report on the basis of all that you have said. 
it'll be published in a magazine journal and of course we'll share it with you thank you once again uh, we'll see you soon again with another edition of our dialogue thank you <laughs>